This lecture complements Chapter 3 on Menu Development uh, that is found in the Lab Manual, Introduction to Food Service Management in the New Millennium. In this lecture, I want to look at the more advanced nutritional menus, basically understanding the principles of good nutrition that should be guiding menu developers. Well, here are the parameters of nutrition that should guide menu developers. First, the core content. Now, in the context of this lab one on menu development, students are going to be asked to assess the mean caloric requirement of the institution using the weighted average um, sort of calculation. So be sure to review those in chapter three. But the idea being that a caloric content is important because you don't want to overfeed your patients with large portions. Uh, and you don't want to underfeed them either, where they're actually losing weight or not getting enough food. The other thing to pay attention to is, of course, the total fat content, because fat is cumbersome on the body. Uh, it does affect the gallbladder, and it can make patients feel very uncomfortable. So you want that fat content uh, in the... Um, and the foods that you're presenting on your menu to be within the healthy range. But there's also the issue of quality fat. We really want to push uh, the Mediterranean, dial, uh, Mediterranean style eating, notably the monounsaturated fats, which should be 11% or higher of the DRI calories. You want to contain the polyunsaturated fats to within 5 to 10%. And of course, you want to keep saturated fat less than 10%. Sodium content is another issue. The more processed the food that you're using, of course, the higher the sodium content. And you certainly don't want your menu uh, to be classified as high in sodium. Uh, that's when the daily content uh, would be higher than 2400 milligrams. You should be able to offer foods that will actually bring the sodium content to less than 2400 milligrams. And of course, there's the moderately high, there's the moderately low, the healthy sodium level. So be sure you understand those, those concepts. And of course, there's the protein content. We know 10 to 35% of the DRI calories, calories is what is regarded as a healthy macronutrient range. But we also know in a practical terms that most individuals consume between 10 and 15% of their DRI calories, and they do very well. Now, the other issue behind protein is, of course, it's the most significant component of the entree, and it costs the most. So you don't want to be overshooting protein content. Consequently, I always advise students to sort of aim for about 15% and not much more. And of course, the next thing to pay attention to is carbohydrate content. The healthy range is 45 to 65, but you get more bang for your buck when you aim between 55 and 65. And that again is because carbohydrates are really the only source of fiber in the diet. So the higher the carbohydrate, uh, the higher end of the healthy range of 45 to 65, uh, the better off for the patient as long as you're selecting whole grains, uh, a variety of fruits and vegetables, um, and notably the cruciferous vegetables. Uh, this is very helpful uh, in supporting, of course, the Mediterranean diet, uh, and of course, um, decreasing as a result the risk of cardiovascular disease and even the risk of some cancers. So your menu then, becomes a teaching tool for the patient. Now, in order to control fats in a very you know, practical way, it's important to also restrict um, the selection of meats to certain types. For example, a cooked meats not drained um, from regular hamburger is not a good idea, right? This needs to actually be restricted. Meats with marbling needs to be restricted if you want to contain the fat content. So visible fat on the outside of the meat needs to be cut. Things like bacon strips need to be really restricted because they are a primary source of really saturated fat. Now, so what are the meats that are permitted? Well, for severe fat restrictions, um, the content of meat should be less than three grams of fat per serving. So what do you have that offers that level of fat? Well, you've got lean flank 
and you have round cuts. These are permitted. You also have fish fillets that are broiled, braised, or that are baked. And you've got chicken breast skinless that's broiled, braised, or baked. So these are important considerations when you're thinking about identifying the menu items uh, that are going to be found on your, um, on your basic menu. All right, so think about this. Come back to this lecture and refer back to these, this terminology and these concepts and, and helping you to identify the right cuts of meat uh, for your particular type of menu. Now, the menu that you're going to be doing, I want to highlight, is not a fat-restricted uh, diet. It really is a healthy diet, a heart-healthy diet, if you will, a diet that's consistent with good um, sort of Mediterranean style dieting. Uh, so it's not necessarily restricted in fat, but it is kind of restricting the amount of saturated fat that comes from meat specifically, notably red meat. So when selecting your meat, you want to select meats for your menu that avoid or that are, don't really have a lot of marbling. You can see on the left two cuts of meat very well renowned for the marbling because the marbling effect uh, provides great taste. So you've got the rib small end steak and you have the T-bone steak. Uh, so um, these, this kind of marbling fat can't be cut away and that's one of the reasons you need to sort of make sure that it's not really prominent in your diet. The fat on the outer edge is what we call the visible fat and that one can actually be trimmed. So choose lean cuts of meat and trim away the visible fat on the surrounding, uh, on the outskirts of the meat, if you will, or of the cut. Uh, but avoid at all costs um, the marbling uh, cuts of meat. So rather than uh, cuts of meat with a lot of marbling, you want to go for lean cuts of meat. So here's an example of beef round steak. So this has very little marbling, as you can see, but it is also a meat that's a lot tougher. So um, choose this kind of uh, retail meat um, for the lower fat content and it requires as a result uh, a slower and longer cooking process but the taste actually becomes quite superior. So there is a benefit to um, your patient or to your resident that's going to be eating this. Yes, longer cooking um, but better taste overall if it's actually done through a braising process uh, that is slow. Now what we're looking at here is a fairly organized chart that moves uh, from um, above to down. Uh, so started with chicken breast and finishing with chicken thighs. And you can see first the total amount of fat and you can see that as we go down the total amount of fat increases. And for the most part uh, but not consistently all the way through, we can see the saturated fat increase as well. Now additionally, I want to point out that the cut of beef and the cut of chicken uh, that are exemplified in this chart are all equal to three ounces. So in other words, when we're looking at the eye of the round, that's three ounces of eye of the round. We've got 4.2 grams of fat and we have um, as part of that 1.5 grams of saturated fat and then we move down the chicken breast you can see is only 0.9 grams of saturated fat and really three grams of total fat in all of that so when we look at the cheaper or the, not just the cheaper I meant the, the leaner cuts I should say of, um, of meat the chicken breast certainly comes in there so at three grams of fat for three ounces you can imagine that if you're between two to three ounces you are really making the mark of being less than three grams of fat so that's actually really good the eye of the round at two ounces uh, would be um, possibly a little you know in the proximity of about three uh, three grams of fat well in fact if you do the calculation exactly it comes to about 2.8 grams of fat uh, if you're doing uh, two ounces of eye of the round. Uh, the same thing would be the top round. The top round would also at 4.2 grams total fat. If you're doing two ounces, uh, given that what you're seeing here is a three ounce, you know, the analysis of a three ounce serving, you'd again be looking at about 2.8 grams. Now, why is that significant? Well, if you were trying to calculate 
which meats uh, would fit the bill for a low-fat um, menu item. And remember, low-fat is uh, less than 5% of uh, the daily value. And for a 2,000-calorie diet, the daily value for fat is 67 grams. So if you do um, 5%, you're really uh, looking at a cutoff of about 3.3 grams. So being under 3 grams is um, a very good cut that fits within the low fat category. But we can now look at the other cuts, notably um, the round tip and the top sirloin, uh, and to see how these particular um, levels of fat fit within what we consider healthy fat uh, ranges. So if you're gonna use the labeling guidelines, the first thing you've gotta do is establish the daily value for the mean caloric requirement of your institution and just for the ease of it let's use 2,000 calories and again what percent of those calories would need theoretically to be fat probably 30 percent is a good one and so when we do the calculation we come up with a daily value of 67 grams so now to answer the question is the um, uh, is the round tip at 5.8 grams considered healthy? Uh, we can easily do this by uh, considering what 5.8 grams represents as a percentage of the daily value, which is 67. So if we do that, we do 5.8 grams divided by 67 grams, which is really um, you know the daily value, and we get 8.6 percent of the daily value. So now, do you remember what percent range is considered a healthy range for a product like fat, for example? Um, do you remember that percentage? I'll let you pause here and think about it. All right, we're back. So it's 5 to 10% of the daily value. So at 8.6%, definitely the round tip at 5.8, 5.9 grams is definitely a healthy uh, amount of fat. What about the um, 6.1 grams of fat for the top sirloin? Well, here if you do the calculation, 6.1 grams divided by the daily value, which is 67 grams, you get 9.1%. So that's still considered a healthy amount of fat. It's not low in fat, but it's not high in fat either. So it's a healthy amount. What about the bottom round at 6.3 grams? Well, at 6.3 grams, we're looking still at, you know, 6.3 divided by 67, we're getting 9.4%. So it's still within that healthy range. Now, the top loin at 8 grams total fat, well, 8 grams divided by 67 times 100, that leaves you with 11.94%. So it's definitely above the 5 to 10% for healthy range. So, but it's less than 20%, so it's called basically moderately high. And so you can do these calculations in a similar way to get an idea of, you know, how to classify the fat content uh, in the food that you're serving on your menu. So in summary, how can we really classify the choices of meat that we just saw? Well, we certainly have very lean cuts of meat with chicken breasts, eye of the round, and top round at 4.2 grams per three ounces. Um, and so that actually fits uh, well within the healthy range. And if you serve two ounces rather than three, you even get into the low fat uh, category, right? So right under low fat status, if we look at chicken breasts, um, we'll get for two ounces we'll get two grams the eye of the round 2.8 and the top round 2.8 then if we look at the healthy fat status uh, we are looking at five to ten percent of the daily value and so what do we have there uh, we have the bottom round as one example at 6.3 grams of fat for three ounces so again for a 2,000 calorie diet we met we take the 6.3 and divide that by the 67 but if you're using when you're doing your calculation for your institution and if the mean average um, caloric requirement is higher then you use that higher percentage and then you can establish the daily value using 30 percent 
uh, of the d 30 percent of the um, of the calorie requirement to get uh, the daily value for fat and so uh, we can see that that actually falls in this calculation here for 2,000 calories it falls within 5 to 10 percent and then when we look at the tenderloin at 8.5 that definitely is between 10 and 19 percent uh, and the same thing for chicken thigh uh, so that's called moderately high and what would then be called high in fat it would be 20 percent or higher of the daily value Now this graph provides you with the different beef cuts. I'm going to go over them briefly to give you the highlights of what needs to be retained from this particular graph. Now the first thing I'll advise is for students to memorize each of the sections. So you should be able to recognize where the chuck is, the rib, the sirloin, the flank, the round, the shank. Um, and all of these different sections. So memorize the chart so you understand um, where the location is for these different cuts. Well, let's start off by identifying the tougher cuts of meat on this uh, beef carcass. Uh, let's start with the chuck, and then we've got the brisket, the plate, the flank, the shank, uh, and then we have the round. And these are the tougher cuts of meat, and they're tough, but if they're um, cooked over a prolonged period of time by braising, uh, you end up with more flavor. The problem is overcooking leads to a tougher cut of meat. Now, <clears throat> the ribs, the short loin, the sirloin, the tip loin, and the tenderloin, um, these are um, the much tender, um, you know, the tender cuts of meat, it means they tend to have marbling as well in them, <clears throat> and they tend to be most flavorful and also, of course, the most expensive. Now, I want to explore um, the summary of the different dietary fats and the health benefits that are associated with it. So in yellow, we're looking at the what we call the polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acids, uh, which uh, you know come primarily, we can see, from safflower and uh, sunflower and corn oil and soybean oil. Uh, and cottonseed oil. This is what a lot of our uh, oils are based on and these are the called the omega-6s. Now on the far left we can see the darker gray and not the darker well the darker gray starting with seven for canola oil and ten for flaxseed oil and these uh, these are what we call the saturated fats and we can see that uh, the saturated fats are exceedingly high in coconut and butter fat and palm oil and then they're moderately high in beef tallow and lard. We can see also that the lighter gray, and there's only really three fats, uh, three fatty acids that are elevated uh, or significant, I should say, in the, uh, in the light gray, which is the alpha linolenic acid. These are the omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, and that is um, a canola oil, flaxseed oil, and soybean oil. And then in the dark, we have what we call the um, monounsaturated oils. And the most significant contributor is olive oil. Uh, the second is canola oil. And the third is peanut oil in terms of the vegetable oil contributions. But we can also see that lard, which historically had been used by your great grandmothers to make those apple pies, uh, got replaced, sadly enough, in the 50s and 60s by shortening which uh, we discovered many years later was high in trans fatty acids. So we would have been better off um, probably sticking with the, the great grandmother's uh, lard um, for the baking of these, uh, of these pies. And we can see that the butter fat, coconut oil, and palm oil, uh, notably the coconut oil, is exceedingly high in saturated fat. There are some controversies about whether or not coconut oil should be consumed. Right now, the, I, I would say the, um, the panel is still out and it's not clear that it's beneficial. At best, you should place it on your skin, but certainly um, I wouldn't run the risk at this stage of consuming coconut oil because of the high saturated fat content and of course the risk for cardiovascular disease. So what's the takeaway for nutrition majors and dietetic majors? Well, 
these students should be able to recognize uh, the, um, the fats or the oils that contribute the greatest amount of monounsaturated fat. So they should know canola oil, they should know olive oil, and peanut oil. They should also know that lard and beef tallow uh, are actually pretty good contributors as well. Now, the second is what oils are contributing the essential fatty acid, alpha-linolenic acid, which is an omega-3 fatty acid. And they should know it's canola oil, flaxseed oil, and soybean oil. All right, so those associations need to be known. <clears throat> they should also know the, the oil that contributes the greatest amount of saturated fat. And it turns out, of course, it isn't animal, but it's actually vegetable. Coconut oil uh, is the highest in saturated fat. Uh, butter fat is also high. Uh, and palm oil is also quite elevated. And they should also be able to recognize uh, you know, what oils are contributing the essential fatty acid, linoleic acid, which is an omega-6, and those are in the yellow. So they should understand that safflower oil, sunflower seed oil, corn oil, soybean oil, um, and cotton seed oil are the great contributors of the omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are high, of course, in the essential fatty acid, linoleic acid. So there are two essential fatty acids that we know of, and that means they're necessary for proper neurological development and proper health, and that's linoleic acid that's found in the yellow bar here, and that's an omega-6. And the second one is alpha-linolenic acid, which is an omega-3. Those are the two essential fatty acids. So when you're developing a menu or you're instructing individuals on good health, it's important to really promote the monounsaturated oils uh, for good protection against heart disease and protection against some cancers. So they certainly um, resemble, obviously, the, the protection health benefits that they get from the Mediterranean diet because that diet is also high in monounsaturated fats, notably olive oil. Now, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the ones that are uh, high in linoleic acid, the omega-6s, offer also good protection against heart disease. But there's a limit to their, um, to their protection because if you consume in excess of 10% of your DRI calories, you can also increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. So here's a summary of what I've just talked about. So the monounsaturated fats are omega-9s, so this is new. Uh, if you remember, the polyunsaturated linoleic is omega-6, and the polyunsaturated omega-3 is linolenic acid. So what about the omega-9? So it protects against heart disease, it protects against some cancers, and the recommended amount is 11% or higher of the DRI calories. So here are the three main monounsaturate oils, um, olive oil, canola oil, and peanut oil. Now this chart gives you the lowdown, so to speak, on the polyunsaturated fats, which are the omega-6, and what we know is they protect against heart disease, but the recommended amount is 5 to 10 percent, so you need to contain them because if you go above 10 percent, there's a tendency for this fat to be pro-inflammatory. So which are the ones, the oils that are high in this particular uh, polyunsaturated omega-6 are the sunflower seeds, safflower, coin oil, and soybean. So what they do is that they form eicosanoids that become pro-inflammatory in a specific biochemical pathway. And pro-inflammation is really one of the most significant contributors to heart disease. So what's being argued here? Well, the argument is that our diet is actually very much cent uh, you know, centered on polyunsaturated oils like sunflower, uh, soybean, and corn. And we're eating far more in our diet than we actually historically have been if we compare ourselves to the 19th century. And in fact, we're eating far more omega-6s. And this opens up a pathway uh, which produces these eicosanoids 
which have a pro-inflammatory sort of response and it causes microinflammation in the body which is really um, you know quite significant in raising the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease now what about those omega-3s well these omega-3 fatty acids protect against heart disease the recommended amount is about one to two percent of our calories and this is these are the oils that we know are high in omega-3 flaxseed soybean canola and I'll add in uh, fish oil the fish oil specifically is elevated in EPA and DHA which are very protective against heart disease now what do they do they form eicosanoids that are anti-inflammatory so they're contrary to what the omega-6s do and so the idea of course is to have more of these in our diet than we currently have because historically if you look at how much omega-3s we're actually consuming we're consuming quite a bit more so oftentimes the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is actually considered uh, you know important uh, in looking at the relative portion of omega-6 and omega-3 relative to health issues. So the ideal ratio um, has not really been established, but what we do know is that the WHO uh, considers that a 5 to 10 to 1 ratio, that means 5 to 10 omega-6 to 1 omega-3, is probably ideal. In Sweden, what they do is they have a 5 to 1 and in Japan specifically they have a 4 to 2 to 1 ratio so um, relatively low um, a ratio that's considered in excess of 10 is actually uh, problematic and here in the United States the ratio we have of omega 6 to 3 is clearly over 10 well why is this important it's important because Historically, in the 19th century, when the cows, the cattle were grass fed, they were actually getting greater amounts of omega 3. So the ratio that we're looking at here was much lower. But since we are grain feeding our cattle and not grass feeding, uh, the oils they're getting are basically a lot of omega 6s. So the ratio becomes much more elevated. So when you're thinking about purchasing food and the time is coming, and some would argue the time's already here, where the choice for grass-fed uh, is uh, certainly more advantageous if you want to advocate or promote your menu as being more health-based. Now, let's consider this problem. Identify below the recommended amount of polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acids that should be in a 2,780 calorie a day diet. So I'll ask you to pause here and to do the appropriate calculations. Okay, let's do the calculation together. So we know that polyunsaturated fats, the recommended range is five to 10% of DRI calories. The DRI calories here are 2780. So we're gonna do 5% of 2780. That's um, uh, 139 calories, divide that by nine, because there are nine calories for every gram, and we get 15 grams for the 5%. And for the 10%, we'll get 278 calories, divide that by nine, and we'll get 31 grams. So the range is 15 to 31 grams because it's respecting the five to 10% recommendation for the polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acids. Let's try the second question. Identify below the groups of oil that contain the most uh, amount of omega-3 fatty acids. Pause here and select your answer. Well, the correct answer uh, is actually B, flaxseed oil, soybean oil, and canola oil. Well, the next question is, uh, why is eating polyunsaturated omega-6 fats in excess of 10% of DR DRI calories not good for the health? So pause here and make your selection. Well, the correct answer is C. Omega-6 fatty acids, when consumed, 
uh, cause the production in the body of eicosanoids, which are pro-inflammatory um, agents, uh, which may increase the risk of heart disease. The next question is an integration question, long answer. If you wanted to create a menu for a home for the age that could be convincingly marketed to the baby boomers now moving into retirement, describe three main features of the menu that would attract this particular segment of the population to the retirement home. Pause here and write down your answers, right? Looking at three main features of that menu. Now here's some answers that could be, I think, uh, probable. The menu is moderately high in sodium. The menu is high in fiber. The menu is made up of recipes that use olive oil. The menu is consistent with healthy eating guidelines for Americans. The menu is consistent with heart healthy guidelines. Uh, the menu is consistent with American Cancer Society guidelines. Now, perhaps there are other uh, sort of marketing concepts that you could probably think of that are different than the ones I've suggested, uh, and that's okay. I just need you to think kind of along these lines and perhaps some additional features of your menu uh, that I haven't actually 